Diyiv. Diyiv Galer, a Kardjag is a Quidahori Salas Nua, Agus Loktalanuna, Skanan Nue Erenuka. Mila Buikas Tushk will shivling a nut. I want to welcome you all and give you a warm welcome to this wonderful film and thank you for showing up and for being here. Um, I think you will really enjoy the film. My name is Paddy Meskel, I'm co chair of the board of Solis Nua, and Solis Nua's mission is to bring the best of contemporary Irish arts to our audiences in Washington, D.C. We have been doing this now for 15 years. We celebrate our 15th anniversary. We're very proud and privileged to do it. We're also delighted to have as a partner New York University, uh, who are wonderful to work with, easy, collaborative, and fun. And I want to make a special thank you to Tom McIntyre, who is Director of External Affairs for NYU, and for all Tom's staff for the work that you have done with Solis Nua down through the years. I also want to thank A.O. Quillon for um, allowing Solis Nua to uh, run this film and to uh, help us present it here. He is a wonderful guy and, and at the CIFF in March, the Capital Irish Film Festival, we showed another film of A's called Comer, a Galway Rhapsody, that got a wonderful reception. This film is in Irish, and there's probably a few lads out there um, without fluent Irish, so we do have English subtitles for you. Um, but since the film is in Irish, I'd just like to say a few things about the Irish language. Um, like all minority languages, Irish is in danger. It's a minority language. It's basically spoken now along the western seaboard from northern Donegal down to Kerry. Maybe 90 to 100,000 pe people would speak Irish on a daily basis. No one really knows uh, when Irish language started. The linguists are fighting over it, but many of them would agree that about 500 to 700 BC is when the Irish language as we know it today began to be spoken. And for the first 1,000 years up to about 500 AD, it was a purely oral language, nothing written down, which may explain why the Irish have a reputation for being good storytellers, the gift of the gab, and we, of course, never spoil a good story with the truth. So from the heyday, the heyday of the Irish language was from about the 5th century to the 17th century. In the first thousand years of its oral existence, the Irish language was like a little stream. It was overground, it was trying to find its direction, but it was gaining in confidence and gaining in expression. Around the 5th century, with the coming of Christianity, the monks began to write Irish down. And they began to write down the stories and the mythologies and the epics and the sagas that the folklore, that the oral folklore contained. And then the, the Norse and the Vikings came in 795, and the Anglo-Normans came in 1169, and they enriched the language. And in that time, the stream that had started back in uh, the BCs now became a roaring river. The language had the strength of a powerful running roaring river, a powerful current. And in that current, the language contained the ideas and the expressions and the imaginations and the hopes and the dreams of, of the Irish people. It was a powerful river, vibrant, intense, bursting its banks. At that stage, the language, the Irish language was the language of the elites. It was the language of education, of commerce, of poetry, of learning. It was the language of the Gaelic aristocracy, the language of the chieftains. And the heyday of the language found an expression that influenced languages in Europe, and our language, Irish language, was under the influence of other languages and other quote-unquote foreigners coming into Ireland. The demise, the, the demise of the golden year of the language happened around the 1700s when the English decided that as a way of colonization, they would transplant the ancient Gaelic people, particularly from Munster and Ulster to the West, and replace them with people from the United Kingdom. That really hurt the language. And as the Irish aristocracy left, the language now went underground. The language went into hiding. It was a crime to speak the Irish language under the penal laws. The, the language almost died, but it never died. It didn't really die. And when the, ca when the famine came in 1845, and the millions who primarily spoke Irish died or emigrated, the language was on its last legs, but it refused to stop flowing, and it refused to die. And now the language, instead of being the language of the elites, the Irish language became the language of the poor, of poverty, of the dispossessed. It was a language of vulgarity, a language of shame. But the language refused to die. 
and it kept flowing underground and underground. And finally, at the end of the 19th and the early 20th centuries, as there was a recovery and a rediscovery of the ancient Irish texts and poetry and music, a little reservoir began to form underground. And the language and the river of the language began to find its way back towards the sky again. And the language began to flow overground again. The story of the language was very tenuous in the 50s and 60s. Um, it was still a language of shame. It was still a language of poverty. But now people began to really appreciate the beauty of it, and particularly the artists. The artists were the people who were the tributaries of the flow of the stream. With their music and dance and poetry and filmmaking and playwrights, they contributed to this tributary and kept the language flowing. Now the language is in an interesting position. It's the third most spoken language in Ireland after English and Polish. But there is a bit of a resurgence of the language. People are learning to appreciate it more and more people are going to Gwail Skullina. There is always hope. There is always hope for the language. And films like Fishna Fushoiga are contributing to the strength of the language. And in fact, you by showing up for this film and engaging with this film are contributing to the strength of the language. So thank you very much for that. The film is about 50 minutes. It's, um, as I say, it has subtitles. After the film, I am delighted that we will be accompanied by Ragnar Alquist. Ragnar is the communications and cultural attache of the Irish Embassy here in Washington. And we will answer your questions and have a discussion for about a half an hour after the film ends. Also, if you look down at the bottom of your screen, you will see a chat button and a Q&A button. If you want to make some comments about the film during the film on the side, just use the chat button. If you don't want to see it, any of those, just, use, just disable it. And if you want to have questions, please use the Q&A button. Thanks again for coming. I hope you enjoy the film. Go many Tanya Basson show. Take care and, and listen to or enjoy Eo Quillon's Fish na Fushoiga. Well, I hope you enjoy that. Um, I am delighted to introduce to you now Ragnar Almquist. As I said previously, Ragnar is communications and culture officer at the Irish Embassy here in Dublin. Ragnar was born and raised, well, raised in Dublin. He was born in Dublin and um, his father was a Swedish folklorist. He's, his mother is an Irish writer. Uh, Ragnar has degrees from UCD in Trinity and has uh, served in the office of the Irish Prime Minister, the Taoiseach, for several years before coming to the United States, and he joined the embassy in Washington about two years ago. So I'd like to start our question and answer session, and please, if you do have any questions, please use the Q&A button. But Ragnar, the, the, the film brings together, I suppose, three things that are very important in understanding Ireland and Irishness. It brings together the Irish language, it brings together poetry and language, and it brings together the connection, the relationship between Irish people and the land, the landscape. Just, you, I know you haven't seen the film before, Ragnar. What are your in, in initial impressions? What are the things that struck you about the film? Well, it made me quite homesick uh, and rather wistful, actually, uh, to be honest, Paddy. Um, it's a bit of a cliche of, of sort of Irish people abroad that, uh, you gather any of them in the room within about five minutes they've identified half a dozen people that they know uh, respectively but actually I think literally half a dozen people who are featured in that film I, I know to some extent or other through my parents predominantly um, Kahlo Sharkig, uh, Declan Kybert was a lecturer of mine, Nuala Nigona would be one of my mother's best friends um, so a lot of people personally that I miss uh, and a lot of places, um, obviously extraordinarily beautiful cinematography and just exquisite landscapes. The piece, the film is very elegiac in quality um, uh, and, and somber in its way really as well. Uh, and I think for all the beauty that's reflected in the, the visuals and the landscape, um, and, you know, a lot of those individuals, Nula and Declan and others are, are really larger than life characters themselves and very ebullient usually, but something very sad listening to them and uh, sort of reflecting on, um, reflecting on elements of the culture anyway that have passed, reflecting on people that have gone um, places that aren't as they held them once to be in, in Cahill's case, I think. So there was a sort of a, a degree of, a degree of homesickness, a degree of wistfulness, 
um, a degree of pleasure in, in just seeing such uh, such beautiful landscape and listening to listening to a language I love again as well. Jeez, if you get any sadder than that, Ragnar, you'll be driving us all to the park. <laughs> you know, how, I, it's, how it's, did you learn? How did you learn Irish in the first place? Like how how you you're a fluent Irish speaker. How did that happen in Dublin? Yeah. So my well, Dublin, I guess I learned my Irish in Dunhuin, uh, down in the Dingle Peninsula, uh, just across the way from the Blasket Islands and Tiroch. And you would have seen some of the the landscape there along the Wild Atlantic Way. So my, my father, as you mentioned, was a Swedish folklorist, um, and he learned Irish uh, from some Kerrymen uh, in Uppsala University, one of the oldest universities in the world, actually, and and in Europe, uh, a little north of Stockholm. Um, and he fell in love with uh, with a lot of the sort of themes that were running through there, talking about mythology. It was more particularly in his case, folk tales, um, and Irish, the Irish language, and and the Irish people as lived in those kind of coastal regions predominantly, and particularly in his case, then the southwest uh, and the Kerry Gaelic areas, those who lived on the Blaskets and their descendants on the mainland. Um, so I grew up sort of spending every summer uh, and, and, and a good chunk of, of, of the rest of the year uh, down in Dunquin. And um, so I went to school all right in Irish language primary school in, in Dublin and Irish language secondary school in Dublin. And there were great places too, but I'd say I learned my Irish in Kerry really. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah. Thank you. There was an interesting question from Malcolm O'Hagan. I'll just read it. Malcolm says, the place where we grew up, in my case Sligo, is not the same place when you return 50 years after school. There's a great sense of loss, a disconnect with the past. How can we preserve that which feeds our soul? Well, I mean, it's a good question. And in some senses, places move on, people move on. I mean, Malcolm himself has moved on and uh, moved out to DC and Chicago and all the wonderful things that he's done in the United States. So nowhere stays uh, in perpetuity uh, as it was. Uh, and, and that's kind of reasonable. I guess two of the themes that you're sort of speaking to there in the film, uh, literature on the one hand, um, and then sort of story. And the two are connected. I mean, our mythology, um, I mentioned my mother's a writer and, and writes in the Irish language as well as in English. A lot of her um, fiction, uh, both in English and Irish, would actually be rooted uh, in her kind of first career, which is like my father is a folklorist. Uh, and, and sort of having respect and understanding for those kind of folk traditions, uh, that kind of tradition of the past. I think that's, that's an important part in retaining a sense of Kind of uh, cultural identity and, and remaining connected, um, remaining connected with our sort of uh, ancestors. Yeah, I remember, like I've been, I came over to America in 1988, so I've been going back to Ireland now for like 30 something years. And I remember when I would go back first, I would bring my wife, I would walk around our village in the fields, and I would be saying to Dirty, like, that's where I used to play football. That's where I shot my first pigeon. Like, that's where I broke my leg. That's where my dad, um, you know, caught his first salmon. That, so, so all the stones and the fields and the rocks, and like, finally, I think she got fed up. She said, like, enough is enough. Like, the past is the past. But the way I used to stay, I'd stay connected to the past was just remembering the stories. And in our neighborhood, like it says in the, in the film, like every field did have a name. And by learning the field's name, the next thing you asked yourself was, how did it get that name? And what I've discovered as I go back time and again now, fewer and fewer people remember how the field got its name and how the field came to be and why that pool in the river is called Tone the Vullen or why that pool in the river is called Tron and Yak or Likonish or File Garavs. And so one of the things I'm doing, Malcolm, to answer your question when I go home is I spend about an hour every day trying to research those names and drawing maps of the pools. And in that, I'm finding that I'm, I'm improving my own knowledge of Irish, but I'm also relearning the connection to my own place. And it's very interesting to me to do that. Um, there's another question from, I think it's Linda. Linda says, Michael Russell said that the tunes he played on the whistle once had words. I wonder if the words were lost when so many Irish speakers died or left. Your thoughts on that, Ragnar? Yeah, in keeping with the, the optimistic tone of the, uh, the conversation so far. <laughs> um, well, I mean, Irish, 
obviously people have left and you know the history of our country is one of emigration particularly from those uh those parts of the country where irish remains sort of live spoken language um and, and those are small pockets uh unfortunately now um but uh, i mean it's it's there's per perhaps some some truth in that I'm I'm taking though I was thinking back to the last event I did with Solis New uh, about a week ago, not even maybe um, with politics and prose, and we had Roddy Doyle, the sort of Dublin novelist, uh, who's uh, a great hero of mine and a wonderful writer, and he was sort of speaking to the um, you know what is it that that sets kind of Dublin authors and Irish authors apart, and you know for a relatively small area how we produce such incredible richness in literature, and spoke to the relevance of Hiberno English. Uh, as a sort of particular and distinct idiom um, from, you know, Anglo-English, if you want to call it that, or American English, and something that was richer and that there were nuances in the syntax and the language which were derived themselves from Irish. But he also spoke, which was interesting uh, and sort of relevant a little bit in the context today, we, we just had the new Lord Mayor of Dublin uh, appointed in the last few hours, uh, Hazel Chu, her name is, and, and she's the daughter, um, she was born and raised in, in Verhouse, but uh, she's the daughter of two immigrants to Ireland uh, and, and grew up with the, you know, quite different experience of Ireland and Irish culture um, than, than many would have had. Um, and, and what Roddy said, what Roddy Doyle said, which I found interesting when he was reflecting on the next generation of great Irish writers, he was speaking to those who would the new, the new immigrants to Ireland and those who are adding their sort of uh, richness and diversity of language and inflecting Hiberno English, if you like. So I don't think that 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 language is lost so much as being subsumed and um, subsumed and and, and almost uh, reintegrated into English, if you like, with the with a slightly different flow. Uh, to to use your metaphor from the the introduction, Paddy. Right. Another interesting question from Murdered Woody. A recurring theme in the film was that we are living in eternity now, which reminds us that Christianity grew out of paganism. How do you think the Irish people have been able to sustain this connection over time, despite the influence of Catholicism? Well, there's one there's one story that I always like is you know I grew up in a you know in the 70s Ireland was not a good place if you were young and want opportunities was no jobs no nothing, but in the early 70s the government and the IDA enticed a major multinational firm from Holland called Ferenca to build a big steel cord factory about four miles from where I was bor born and raised. And the Irish government put in millions and millions of pounds and the Dutch company put in millions and millions of pounds. And the Irish government bought a hundred acres of land near there to build the factory. And there was just, there was just one little problem, was that right in the middle of the hundred acres was a fairy fort. There was a, a white thorn tree in the middle of a field, and of course our lore and our denshockus was that the fairy people lived there and you never went near that fort. So none of the Irish, when, when the, the plant got under construction, none of the Irish workers would go near the fort and would go near it to, to, to um, you know, knock it down to build the factory. And the Dutch, as Nuala Nigonel said in the, in the film, you know, are very kind of empirical people. And they were saying, what in the name of God is this? They won't knock down a tree. So what they did was in the middle of the night, they flew some lads over from Holland, they got a bulldozer and they knocked the tree. So what, how was our reaction? Well, lads, like you've made a big mistake there. So the factory was built in 72, it closed in 77. It had five of the most like horrible years any factory ever had. Its CEO was kidnapped by the IRA. Uh, the factory made steel cord for tires and halfway in the late 70s with the oil crisis, um, you know, car sales went down and there was no need for steel cord for tires. So the factory totally shut. And of course, we all said, what else did you expect? And in fact, Maeve Hillary, who was the president of, or who was the wife of the president of Ireland at the time, Paddy Hillary, she said on public radio, well, what did you expect? So, you know, so it's, we're not too far from that mirror that is what I said. I firmly believe that if you scratch Irish people, the pagan re immediately like, comes out of us. And um, there is a paganism that we haven't lost. I think we're losing it. Um, you know, we're beginning to lose it and, and the, the, the connection, the relationship isn't as strong as I think when we were growing up, life has gotten more complicated. Life is, there's many more diversions, but there's still, in Ireland, people, if you scratch a little bit, out jumps the pagan. What would you think, Ragnar? 
Yeah, funny. Um, another of my favourite Irish authors who, uh, again, you hosted at Solis New not too long ago is uh, Kevin Barry. Uh, yeah. His kind of most recent novel, uh, Night Boat to Tangiers, features a ferry fort as well and a sort of doomed uh, housing estate development down in Cork, like, which is uh, a, a, a linchpin of the, the narrative. So uh, that sort of um, received folk wisdom is still very prevalent uh, in Ireland and so not unique to, to that circumstance you outlined. I mean, those are two interesting aspects. Um, to go back to your kind of reference to place, um, Irish people, I mean, it's true of all people really, but, but more so in Ireland than, than perhaps here, uh, which you know, travel across this great continent was always part of the American psyche. But Irish people were typically quite rooted uh, in a particular, you know, location. And yes, there was the kind of um, specter of emigration and the American wake and everything that went with that. But your sense of being bound to a particular community and particular village or or, uh, or otherwise parish was, was very, very strong. I suppose it's not as strong today because, you know, we're more, even within the island of Ireland, uh, open to moving. Uh, I mean, I moved uh, several times in, in my youth. Um, I've moved kind of a, a diplomat's life is quite nomadic anyway, but every two or three years, and I'm usually moving around from city to city at the best of times. So I think this pandemic has been a sort of unique experience in sitting still for sort of three months for the first time in a long time for me. Um, but that sense of isolation versus the, the sort of globalization and, and, and the, the constant movement that we have now is one dislocating factor for sort of Irish identity and national identity now. And then the second, uh, which you reference is is uh, the erosion of religion, um, I suppose, as a as a as a guiding structure and and a point of um, focus for for a community. Personally, I'm I'm atheist, but I see a lot of value uh, that the religious kind of uh, institutions provided. I mean, obviously, a lot of harm that were done as well. But uh, as a as a as a point of identity and as a point of connection and community. Um, and clearly that's been eroded as, and, and will be as Ireland kind of increasingly secularizes. I'm half Swedish, so I can see you know, what manifested in Sweden and that's kind of been a, a loss of, a partial loss of identity for Swedes as well as they grew uh, more a-religious. Um, but on a, on a brighter note, I think you're right that that sort of pagan underpinning is, is quite strong still. Uh, and those, I mean, even underpinning paganism and predating it, if you like, is a sense of seasonality and a sense of connection to land. I mean, that's where, you know, the fundamental pagan festivals, uh, such as they were, were grounded in, in the changing of the seasons. And it's been nice uh, for me these last four or five years as a diplomat to see a sort of resurgence in the celebration of uh, Bridget's Day on the one hand, uh, in 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 uh, in our sort of cultural calendar, uh, and then sauna in uh, Halloween on the other, and it's just almost as if a little bit of a reclaiming um, of uh, of what were pagan holidays, and, and even before them, sort of parts of the season, uh, and a sense of them being bound to sort of national identity in Ireland. So those are positive things to me. Yeah, I remember on the August the 15th, which I think is the Feast of the Assumption, the, the priest, we, we would all go down to a, lo a local well to celebrate Our Lady in the Feast of the Assumption in the morning. Then in the afternoon, my dad would bring us down and he'd say, this is the real celebration. And that was the pagan one. So it was very interesting how the two, the one well served the two, uh, the two uh, purposes. Um, uh, the question here from Patricia Gallagher, I've been told that it was decided to teach the Irish language as a second language in school. Is this no longer the case? I'm not sure of that, uh, Ragnar. Well, no, it's a, it's a, I mean, Irish is first language of the state w with English, so, uh, and is taught uh, in all primary and secondary schools in Ireland. So there are, Paddy, as you mentioned, and it's been one of the aspects that's seen a resurgence of the language in part, uh, an increasing number of Irish language primary and secondary schools where all subjects are taught entirely through Irish um, and that's where how I was schooled um, but that's that's they've been phenomenally successful uh, in terms of I mean uh, in terms of educational attainment as well they tend to be uh, very high achieving schools a lot of sense of community and sort of school identity very often super strong affiliation with uh, aspects of Irish culture that are very strong here in the US, you know, Gaelic sports and games uh, and, and above all music and dance. Um, so 
no, there's there's no. I mean, Irish continues to be taught. It's it's the question of to what extent it continues to be learned uh, and how fluently it's spoken. Uh, yeah. And I will say this is sort of anecdotal, but uh, I know a lot of primary school teachers, uh, and my wife is one back home. Um, uh, and a lot of them that I've spoken to, uh, including those who are sort of native Irish speakers themselves, tell me that increasingly the best Irish speakers in, in primary schools in Dublin uh, are the the children of, of immigrants or immigrants themselves. So they have, um, usually I suppose they, they already have a second or third language uh, in addition to English, but uh, also a sort of degree of curiosity and, and sort of respect for the languages as a sort of element of the culture to which they're now connecting. Uh, yeah. And it's sometimes, I mean, it's an unfortunate legacy, but sometimes that appreciation of the the value of the language is not there amongst uh, you know uh, Irish people who 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 who's answered. I remember, I remember in, in Limerick last year, I I I was uh, driving along and I kind of cut across a young lad. And I'd say he, he was black. I'd say born in Nigeria but living in Ireland. And I cut across him and I stopped to apologize. And he cursed at me in the most fluent Irish that I've ever been cursed at in my life. So I was delighted. I said to him, "Would you say that again?" And he, so he was. But I agree that a lot of the immigrant population in Ireland, of which about 14 or 15 percent of the full Irish population now, like were born outside of Ireland, but they are beginning. The last question I will take is from uh, Barbara de Garcia, and she wants us to comment on this. As a linguist, I've always believed that language and culture are inextricably linked. The British set up free public schools in Ireland before they were widespread in English, in England, for the purpose of eradicating the Irish language and to erase Irish culture from these children. The film's point about remembering place names is strongly linked to remembering who we are. Remember the name in Irish, and so much more is embedded in remembering that. Could we please comment? Yeah, well, I mean, you should go and see. There's a, a wonderful play uh, by Donegal playwright who really should have won the Nobel Prize but didn't, Brian Friel, called Translations, which is all about this. Uh, maybe you have seen it, but uh, if there's a production on, uh, and it's, it's frequently enough produced still here in the US as well, it speaks to exactly that, how how names uh and this is true of other languages as well of course like in their the native language have a deep kind of kind of clear and historical meaning um, and when translated into english in this case uh, they lose all that uh, and much of the identity that goes with it so you know it's undoubtedly true and i mean i suppose on the positive side um many historians uh, amateur and professional uh, amateur including paddy who, who've, who've done you know work at a local level uh, to go and identify and you know retain those kind of um the understanding of what those locales uh, were named uh, and those things have been documented and they are you know every uh, signpost in, in in ireland official one should have the the irish name of the location on it uh, and you know i know from the folklore of, uh, department that my father was head of in, in University College Dublin, um, that those Luganum, uh, as they're called, the sort of place names, they're, they're all documented and they're uh, a question of whether they're used or not, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Just the last comment I'll make is about you know, the Din Shankus, which was mentioned in the film about the, the lore of place names. You know, everyone's probably visited or heard of, you know, the Giant's Causeway in Antrim, you know, that wonderful, unique formation of rocks off the Antrim coast. Well, there's a similar formation off uh, the west coast of Scotland, kind of generally opposite the Giant's Causeway. And the story, and the story, well, how did that happen? And the story is that, you know, Finn McCool, one of the ancient Irish heroes, was having a fight with a giant in Scotland. And they fought all day and they ran out of weapons. So finally they began to pick up big rocks and throw them at each other. And that's how the Giant's Causeway in Antrim and the similar uh, formation in, in Scotland, um, you know, came to be. So all these kinds types of stories and all these types of lore about place names, you know, add to our sense of who we are, I suppose, our sense of identity. And I suppose being an immigrant and being part of the diaspora, I've, but being able to go back you know, on planes and stuff, I've often wondered how painful and how, how painful it must have been for people in the 16th 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries who knew they would never come back and they would never smell the smells or hear the sounds or see the sights of their homeland and how would they describe them to their children and like that sense of pain and loss that must have been there. Yeah, um, I might finish just a, on, a, on a quick point to, to end on a, on a, on a sort of high note. Yes. Uh, 
you mentioned the Giants Causeway. One of the very beautiful images I've seen uh, and the upsides of this uh, pandemic in the last three months is to see heather blooming uh, and wildlife returning to the Giants Causeway, which obviously is trampled underfoot by uh, a thousand very welcome visitors any given day of the year. But because it's been empty uh, and there's been no footfall the last few months, if you run a Google search, you'll see these spectacular images of heather and wildlife and wildflowers blooming along the causeway, which is yeah. beautiful. And the second thing, speaking of places that are extremely beautiful, uh, we're doing an event tomorrow, the afternoon here at uh, 2 p.m. with the US Embassy in Dublin and with TG Catter, the uh, Irish language television studio, uh, which is gonna be broadcast from the Cliffs of Moher um, uh, down in Clare uh, and featuring a, a range of some of the best young Irish musicians uh, winners of the Gratham Keol of the last number of years. So if you check out the embassy's Twitter feed and you're interested and have a, have time after lunch tomorrow, you'd be very welcome to join. Thank you, Ragnar. Thank you very much for joining us, Ragnar. Really appreciate it. I want to thank Tom and NYU. Thanks, Tom, again. And mostly I want to thank you all for showing up and for staying and for staying for the question and answer. And as I said at the start, by engaging in this film and by supporting a film that is, you know, written in Irish and, and, and spoken in Irish, by just that alone, you are supporting the language and supporting that stream, that flow that, that the language needs. So thank you all. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for showing up. Enjoy the rest of the evening and Sláin Gafol. Sláin